Cool. Let's do it. All right, guys. So it's Monday. We are um, we are going to kick off this week with these rock stars, um, Kevin Hinton and Emily Fair of the Fair Hinton Group. Um, the topic today is uh, a good topic, right, that a lot of people ask questions about. And uh, it is one plus one really equal three, right? So the power of a successful partnership. I'm sure that we've all kind of heard, right? Like, you know, if I could just replicate myself or something like that, you know, if I just had a partner, um, you know, that things would be easier, maybe, right? So at the end of the day, Kevin and Emily are going to, um, they're going to share with us, right, about what, uh, what it means to them as far as a partnership is concerned. So a little bit about them. Emily's been in the business for 11 years now. Can't believe that, Em. That's amazing. Um, Kevin, Kevin is going on his fourth year in the business. Um, in two years' time, they have built a very successful business, all right? They have built um, a business that does roughly 115 plus transactions for 45 million in production. So first and foremost, kudos to you guys. That's, uh, that, is, that is pretty awesome. That's, uh, that's a pretty cool feat, a pretty cool uh, accomplishment. Um, your team structure is you have two rock star admins that I see, um, see in, the, in, in there right now. So what's up? Give us a little love, give us a little love admin. Um, and then you have six team agents as well. So, and then some, some of the agents are here as well. So give, give, give some of that. So, um, so you guys, that's really impressive. All right. So, um, what I want to know from you guys, obviously, as far as the partnership is concerned and other people are concerned is what, um, you guys have mentioned that you're rule followers, right. And that you're very consistent, but what's, you know, outside of that, what is, what is your mindset? And um, I'm going to go this to you. What's your mindset of how you guys approach this business? Sure. Um, well, I'm going to steal Kevin's because I, I agree with it. Um, but Kevin's been saying this since we met. Uh, well, we just learned today, I think. What it, was it? Four years ago, yeah? That we met? Yeah. 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 Um, and so just to back up a step. So, Joe, I don't know if you know this but or you remember this, but you introduced Kevin and I right. in New Orleans way back in the day. Um, and so anyway, so Kevin and I became friends and then eventually obviously started a business. But one of the things that Kevin has said uh, year after year after year is if that dummy can do it, I can do it better. And so we, we use that all the time because we watch this industry. It's like, you know, there's a lot of really great agents and then there's just, there's a few that aren't the best. Right. right. And so we watch all this unfold and it's like, my God, there's no reason that we can't do what somebody else is doing and do it even better. So I totally stole that from you, Kev, but that's what's like I've absorbed over the years. And that's what keeps this going. It's like, there's no, there, if there's no reason not to, then we should be doing it. We kind of have a responsibility to be successful because we can. That's awesome. That's awesome. So Kev, I'm going to let, I'm going to let you elaborate on that. So this, so this, this whole thing is, Hey, if this person can do it, I can do it better. Um, where, where does that come from? Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I was specifically referring to you when Emily called you a dummy, if that's how that was taken. No, no, that's not what I meant. Um, okay, okay, just checking. That's um, not, not really this. I was just awesome. saying. It's awesome. Anonymously. Um, I'm sure there's some truth to that. So. Yeah, I guess kind of, um, you know, where, where Emily's going with that is, um, I guess if, you know, if our, if our team kind of has a philosophy or maybe, maybe uh, it's more mine a little bit, like in general, just being completely comfortable being uncomfortable. Um, and I guess what I mean by that is essentially having no, no excuses, right? So I moved from New York to Chicago four years ago in January. I was a golf pro my whole life, you know, didn't know anything about real estate and whatnot other than my brother had been in it and things like that. And I guess that kind of just, that kind of started things off and I got a lot of support from him and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of um, just kind of transferred throughout our business in general that for the most part, we say yes to everything. Say yes to everything and figure it out. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. As opposed to feeling like you need to be an expert in something. Um, and we see, I see that all the time with, um, you know, if I'm teaching within the market center and things like that, that you know, an agent wants to thoroughly understand the contract before they're comfortable talking to their clients and things like that. And it's like, hey, newsflash, no offense, but you don't have any clients. So the contract doesn't matter. Right. So, <laughs> Um, you know, that's kind of the philosophy in general, I would say. And that's why, you know, we do everything from condos to single family homes to we're in the talk we're doing our first deconversion and we, you know, investment properties and multi-use and things like that, that 
we in general just say yes to our sphere and that's where it comes from and just figure it out okay yeah so you guys both you guys em i know this about you too is you guys um you guys do believe that you know you need to push outside your comfort zone and you know we've heard the, the bold laws and everything like that as no one succeeds in their comfort zone right so em you i mean talk about that from your perspective um how do you push yourself outside of your comfort zone uh well i would say that it happens pretty much on a daily basis i mean i think my comfort zone is probably just being like a solo agent selling i don't know 30 properties a year and making 250,000 and just being really happy and then being alone on my couch in my free time talking to nobody that's like my happy place that's my comfort zone and so this whole adventure of creating a team and building a whole business is like the by definition that is just like not comfortable to me now we are very successful i think and we've like figured it out but like on a daily basis everything i mean i think where i feel most uncomfortable is like having a business and putting it out there like to you guys all right now is like super vulnerable because at any time it could just all crash and burn and you guys are all watching yeah. and you guys specifically but also you know the our friends our family our clients if we fail it's not gonna go great for our egos so just day to day like doing this thing is super uncomfortable um but it's totally rewarding and i i don't think i could go backward to like some days i'm like oh yeah wouldn't it be great to be a solo agent and just like mind my own business and nobody talks to me right. and i think that would be fun for like a week and then of course i would go back to this right miss this the part where you have to push and grow every single day and you never get to hide under a rock ever and that's uncomfortable and also really wonderful because um, that's how we're gonna grow. Um, and then ultimately growing our business and growing ourselves personally is gonna give us the life that we truly want, which is one that we've designed to be exactly how we want it rather than just like falling into something. So that's kind of how I think about it. So you guys, you guys, as far as your partnership is concerned, you guys, well, you know, Kev, you said, hey, I say, we say yes to everything, you know, and you guys yeah. kind of agree here that you push outside of your comfort zone. Is that something that you two help each other with? Is that something that that expectation was set before you were going into your partnership that, hey, we're going to take some risks here and we're going to get we're going to get outside of our comfort zone? Yeah, well, I would say kind of like like your line initially. I mean, I think the reason why one plus one equals three and you should not venture into a partnership unless you can truly say that uh, because people want partnerships for buddy and accountability and things like that. And those are the wrong reasons to mixed bank accounts and all the things that, um, you know, that go into that. Um, but the reason why it does is because Emily and I are extremely different. So what makes her comfort, what makes her uncomfortable is really different. That makes me uncomfortable, right? The fact that I know how many listing appointments I went on in July of 2018 initially made me extremely uncomfortable, yeah. right? Um, yeah. I was a golf pro and I had to be there in time for my lessons, but I'd never worked in an office in my life. Um, I'm embarrassed to tell you how long I had my AOL email address, right? It took a long time to get rid of. That was a big thing. Um, so, so anyway, so if, if, um, you know, if some of the accountability and the tracking and the systems that um, go along with being a really productive team, those would be the things that make me uncomfortable. Right. Where Emily is going to be, you know, doing tons and tons and tons of open houses and sphere events and clients events, things where, you know, our disc tests are very different. Um, yeah. So that's why it works uh, is because we can, we, we kind of have it from the, the both, both extremes covered. So Kev, or, um, talk to me about that. So it works yeah. because you guys are completely different. Do you think yeah. you, that, that is a, that is a necessary for a partnership or what if you guys were, were not as different? Do you think it would work? Uh, well, I guess I could, I don't know. I don't know. Um, because I haven't done that, but I think where you have to be aligned is in like core values and vision. And yeah. then whether or not you're different is, you know, kind of, I guess that would be fluid based on two, uh, two different people in, in a different partnership. But for us, like we, we had worked together actually on, on MKT properties on your team, Joe, as buyer's agents. And so we knew 
before we started a partnership, we knew that we worked well together. We knew that we had the same work, work ethic, the same value system. We had a vision for where we wanted to go in our personal lives and also our professional lives. And so then when we sat down and talked about that, we realized that we had these two skill sets. I mean, if you look deep into our business, you'll see like, we're not doing the same thing on a daily basis. We're not like mimicking each other. We're feeding off each other, but we're not mimicking each other. I mean, you'll see Kevin is like way more into the sales side and sort of the strategic side of the business. And I'm way more into like operations and HR, right? So I'm, I, I would be happy just running the office and Kevin would be happy crushing the sales. So yeah, we, we are different and, and we support each other in our differences. Maybe, I mean, if you guys are out there thinking about a partnership and you feel like you're really similar to your partner, it, it could work. I'm not going to say that can't work, but you, as long as your core values are the same and you have a like combined vision, then I think that's a good place to start. That's great. That's great advice. Um, so Kev, M said, you know, mentioned that you guys, you know, started talking about your vision and you started talking about like, you know, what your work ethic was and things like that. Was that a necessary that you guys set up? I mean, how in line was that vision, you know, before you guys decided to partner and was it, you know, what was the plan and the steps that were taken that you guys said, okay, this will work if we do X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So, I mean, to Emily's point, there's, you know, as much as we kind of like to joking back and forth that we're extremely different. If you're not aligned, if you don't have hundred percent trust, you're not aligned on your core values and things like that, um, then it would never work. Right. So that, that, that we're very similar on that. Um, you know, one thing that I would say is, you know, neither of us, um, you know, two and a half years ago said, Hey, we want to be the biggest team in Chicago. Right. Like we, ne we never said that it's, um, it's continually evolving. You know, our, our first hire was Molly, who we adore um, very much, who then hired Kim um, and, and whatnot. And so initially, right, it was, you know, how it works is, you know, first you're like, oh, I'm a, I love being a buyer's agent on Joe's team. There's all this security. This is great. I'm never going to do anything else, right? And then you're like, oh, solo agent's kind of interesting. And then you're like, all right, you know, I need some leverage and let's make my first hire. And then you, then you have things like, well, you know, I don't, I'm not comfortable having a team agent or a buyer's agent because everybody always wants to work with me, right? Because nobody can do better than me. And then you realize, nope, Allie's way better at that than I am. And, right. and then it kind of just continues, right? So our core values don't change, but our trajectory is always different because you look back and you say, well, you know, well, we did this, that, you know, we did, the, we did X last year and we certainly weren't perfect. Right. So, um, you know, you, you know the, the, the goalposts keep moving. And the other thing is, is when you have really good team members that yeah. are super, super talented, if you don't grow it, unfortunately, you're going to lose those people because right. they're talented people that have aspirations of their own. So you, you have to, in a way, uh, yeah, continue yeah. to add value and grow your business. You guys have some talented people on your team, right? And talent's going to push you guys, right? And I'm yeah. sure they're pushing you guys well. Um, um, Kev said a lot about core values. Did you guys come up with your core values together? Did you come up with them as a team? Did you come up with them as a partnership or did you come, you know, how did you guys come up with those? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we ultimately ha had, have core values that are similar. So it wasn't like a huge stretch to agree on them, but we did, uh, we did our, our mission, vision and values. Like, I don't know, Molly, like three, two years ago, Molly helped us organize all that, but we were, pretty adamant that we wanted to run our business like a business. So we're not just selling real estate. We're actually running a, a pretty tight business on the back end. So we started with mission, vision, and values. Um, none of it I have memorized, so don't ask me, please. <laughs> um, but I have it written down somewhere. Um, but we know like our core values, like money is one. Um, fun is one of our biggest core values that we remind each other of all the time. Integrity, like we, yes, we decided together and then we wrote it down and, and we have it in all of our job postings. We have it in all of our quarterly reviews um, because it's really important. We're not just out there selling real estate. Like we're, we could be selling whatever. We don't care. I mean, sure. Real estate's fun and it's great and it gets us through, but we could take this model, I think, and apply it. I mean, widgets is, is, is really what we built our business on. So guys, this is, there's, there's a little bit of sarcasm here on this next statement, but there's truth to it as well. So I'm going to elaborate on it. I would imagine the core value of fun kind of, you know, Kevin, Kevin 
Kevin kind of leads that a little bit, maybe, and then integrity, may, maybe a lot. Like, like, but you know, <laughs> you're also integrous, right? And then maybe, maybe integrity is more Emily. No, no I, again, that was sarcasm. But my point to this is this: <laughs> What if somebody else? What, you know, how does that work for you? If someone else's core value is this and yours is more this, how do you align those core values? Like, meaning, how are they both important to you guys at you know at the at, at the same pace? Well, I'll, I'll say, because it is true that Kevin's more fun. Everybody knows it. So we have this joke on our team, like bad cop, good cop. Um, and that's fine. It works. It's fine. It's mom, dad, right? It's like you go to one for one thing and one for the other. Um, but the thing is about like, with, with specific to fun, but all of our values, like if Kevin's core values are not being met, mm -hmm. then he's not going to be happy and he's not going to thrive. And if my core values aren't being met, then I'm not going to thrive. So we have to like appreciate our different strongest values and then su support one another in that right. um fair enough all right guys you guys talked about strategy and you told me in the beginning before that you guys are rule followers all right um and that you're consistent and you're consistent yes. rule followers i would imagine so what what rules are you guys following yeah i mean i don't particularly like rules by by, by really you know, you know yeah. um but Emily told me I need to, I need to like them, so I do. Um, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I think what I think kind of the point that you're getting at is our business is super boring, and there's really nothing special about what we do. Um, but in a way that kind of makes it special, not to not to um, sound arrogant on it. And what I mean by that is all all we try to do is essentially if we have a niche right our, our niche is our sphere and all we really try to do is be super consistent with the with the basics and really what that is is grow your sphere on a continual basis and by adding value consistently remind them that you're in real estate and that's all that we do yeah. Um, yeah. and you know yeah we have some cold lead sources we have some team members that um, they're very much into creating cold leads and things like that, but then they quickly become our sphere and then it's all, it's all the same. So that's, that's all that we do. Got it. So um, when Kev yeah. says, you know, we've heard Gary Keller say before that success is boring. Yeah. You know, um, do you, do you agree with that as well? Is that, is that a value that you guys um, <laughs> share? Yeah, it's totally boring. Um, one of the um, requirements on our team is that everybody's in the office at nine o'clock every day. Um, like basically with no exceptions unless previously scheduled. Um, and the reason we do that is because from nine, well, from, from 9.30 to 11.30, we expect that our team is doing some type of lead generation and we're not perfect at it by any means, but we do believe that that should be the first thing in our heads every single day. And I think, I think it's a little boring. I think Kevin probably thinks it's a little boring. I think our teammates probably think from time to time it's boring, but we know that like if we, do it and even if we don't do it perfectly but if we make the effort to do it every single day in some way shape or form that's what's going to drive our business and so we enforce that and our team i mean i i know many of you guys are on the call i, th I think they like the accountability and the structure i mean that's why people join teams that's why we had a team so that we can all come together every single day for one common mission and one common goal and it's not fun it's totally boring and it's even it's like more than boring it's like frustrating and it's mundane and it's like it's like chipping away at something where you don't know if you're ever going to see the results of it, but ultimately you do. And then it's like a huge win. So yeah, it's, it's the worst. So you guys have your mission, you have your vision, you have your values. Yeah. As a partnership, how do you guys collaborate and combine on perspective? How do you check in on how those are going? Yeah. Kev, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I would say, um, you know, it's very much, I'm not married, but very much like a marriage, right? Like, we, we call each other out pretty, pretty quickly on things. And, um, you know, if it's uh, Tommy and Josh, uh, like to say, kind of lay the fish on the table, like we basically don't let things, <laughs> so we don't, we don't go to sleep mad kind of thing. Um, yeah. We have different backgrounds. If yeah, you, yeah, we don't live in the same house. Yeah. Um, like popular belief. But, but, it's, but it's very much like, and I'm probably the most guilty, right? Like that wasn't your best statement right like you know, you know and and emily will call me out on it on it pretty quickly and whatever the example is but we we, we um you know we kind of rectify it very quickly we basically have something like you know don't like like don't embarrass me or vice versa right like there is no playing 
Molly against you or you against Kim, like, like, and the same rule with our agent, right? Like that is absolutely a non, a non-starter because drama on our team is just the absolute last thing that I want because now it's not fun. It's not enjoyable. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't mean people don't have feelings and emotions and things need to be nipped in the bud. And of course it's an open forum to talk about it, but we just try to get to things right away. So nothing, nothing festers. And there've been next to no issues, but yeah. anything that comes up, we get to it right away. That's, yeah. that's great. That's, that's great. Uh, Kev, did you plan that shirt to, to match your background? Cause it looks. I did. I did. Since my dry cleaners closed, I've worn this like, well, I've only had worn a collar about four times in the last month, but same, same shirt for the most part. It looks great. Even Natal asked me that, ask you that. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So guys, you guys are consistent. What activities, what activities are you guys consistent on? Emily, you mentioned, you mentioned um, lead gen. Yep. But that's in any context, like whatever. So, so walk us through what, what are you guys consistent on as far as um, your activities? Yeah. Well, we have really good systems in, um, in the back end of our, um, of our business. So on the listing side and also on the transaction side. So um, Molly is um, our executive admin and she runs our 33 touch. So our 33 touch is like almost set it and forget it. I mean, Molly and I collaborate on it quite a bit when it comes to like the content, but in terms of like how it's run, that's almost like just hit a button. So that's cool. But the real systems that are in place that have changed our business in the last, well, since we hired Molly and then added Kim 18 months after that is leading into a listing, all of the um, communication with our sellers and with each other, that is near flawless at this point. Um, And then once we go under contract, those systems have been tightened up so much by the addition of our transaction manager, Kim. Um, So we can run an entire start to finish transaction with almost no, I mean, unless craziness happens, but like no hiccups along the way from a systems perspective. And that has changed our entire business because now Kevin and I can run agent meetings we can go on more listing appointments we can take days off like fill in the blank we can do more strategic things and and so can our agents um so that is like crazy crazy time as well right yeah Yeah. yep so so the light bulb went off right guys where all of a sudden you were like wait a minute i'm running a business i should have a system on this right yeah yeah duh (laughs) right i mean it took 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 me i'll speak for myself took me a very long time you know I was like, wait a minute, why come I don't have a listing system, right? You know, so you guys have that system. So um, the world did change. Um, you know, you just mentioned that, unless whatever. So you take your listing system. What, uh, what has changed now that the pandemic has hit? Yeah, well, one of the things that we've been doing, obviously, like everybody else, is a ton of Zoom calls. But what we've learned is that I always believed that there should never be two agents in the same room ever unless you're drinking. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I like really believe it that we do not need to be in the same room or even in the same neighborhood. We don't even need to be in the same city to have effective communication with our clients and with each other. So it's cool. We've been using Zoom for all of our, we still do our one-on-one agent meetings. We still do our weekly team meeting. We've done some cool webinars. We're doing more, but we've then used it with clients. So we've done I don't know, Kev, how many listing appointments? We've done a a good handful and we've got a bunch on the calendar where we're doing actual listing appointments with our clients like we would in their living room, except we don't have to wear pants. It's great. (laughs) It's it's real. I mean, it works. It works. We can share screens. We have like, like, I don't know. We, I'm, I feel like we're doing it better. Kev, would you like all of a sudden I'm smarter because I've got data in front of me and I'm not like their kids aren't screaming. There's no dogs that are you know, we're just like getting to business. It's really good. Yeah, yeah I, I think to that to that point. So since you since you can't be face to face with them, right? It kind of it kind of forces you to think more about you know what is my value proposition? How do I add value? And I you know I think where Emily's kind of going with that is every agent does business their own their own way, right? But I think that you know for example, right? If if we sold a hundred and some places this year, like. I'll go to one or two closings just kind of for giggles, right? Like never going to go to a closing. That's three hours of my day. I have no idea if it's going to close. I'm down in the loop, parking, all that stuff. That's, you know, and that took an entire day of lead gen, right? There are, and you know, and 
why do I need to be on an inspection the entire time and things like that. And, and I, get the, I get the instinct of where, I, I think what happens is, is an agent typically masks that and they, they say that they're trying to good, provide good customer service. Mm -hmm. But what it really means is that they're struggling to add value in more meaningful ways. So the only thing that they tend to know to do is just to create a face-to-face, -face, which, is, which is better than doing nothing. But now it's so unproductive and it's not scalable and it yeah. wrecks my day. And it's, and it's like, what did you do today? You're like, I went to closing. She's like, you, that, you got rewarded for an activity three months ago, right? right? right. So it's backwards thinking. And I, and I get the instinct. So anyways, and that's kind of what the virtual stuff is like any kind of, this is just basically market disruption that yep. anytime there's an industry where there's disruption, there's going to be efficiencies that come out on the other side of it and yep. less face to face is going to be one of them. Yeah. That's, awesome. that's great. Um, you said um, that you, you've always thought that, you know, two agents should, shouldn't be in the same room. That was a belief that you've always had. Yeah. Have you share Did you share in that belief? It took me a little while to get my head wrapped around that um, because you maybe it took a little longer to add my value so if in doubt i'll just be there and 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 that's you know but the other thing that that you're learning is whether it's a buyer or seller or whatever they don't know how this goes right they are going to do what you tell them it's all about how you present it and that you have a game plan right. so if the scenario was every single listing appointment hey this is how we do it we do a zoom call for efficiency we run you through our entire team Mm -hmm. um, we've got everything ahead of time. And when you want to take the next step, we'll come face to face, right? Mm -hmm. That could be, that could be, a, and they don't know any different. Uh, it's not any different than teams with showing agents where you say, and it's all about kind of getting over, um, you know, your belief system that this can be a more efficient way to do it is, Hey, on our team, our showing agent does all of our first showings, right? right. He or she is going to be boots on the ground. When the second showing happens, we're either going to get on a zoom, go through the comps, or I'm going to go in person. That's how we do it. They don't care. They don't care. They probably like your showing agent more than you anyway. They just want to know that you had a game plan. Yeah. Um, that's all they're asking for. And that, that, that level of service is there, right? Yeah. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and because you have a plan and a system, right, that, that, that level of service is there for, for them, right? We joke about that all the time, right, is that, you know, we don't, uh, the, you know, the, the, what, what was the one we used? Starbucks, right? Like, you know, they don't, they don't care that, um, who's my main man that owns Starbucks? Schultz, right? Like, you know, I don't care that he's not doing, uh, you know, brewing the coffee and mopping on the floors and everything, right? So, and when you said two agents shouldn't be in the same room together, um, you know, and it, that was easy for you to pivot now that this has happened. So, right? Like, you know, as far as you were, yeah. you always thought that and you always planned for that. So, you know, the pandemic hits, yeah. how quickly did you guys pivot into virtual listing presentations and what did that look like? Yeah, I think we, we pivoted like immediately. Like we had virtual listing appointments, I think two and three weeks ago. Um, and we, it's, it's like Kevin was saying at the beginning of this call, like what, one of the things that we're, I think, really good at is we just decided to do it. We didn't practice it. We didn't like even really discuss it. We were like, okay, here's a Zoom link. I think, I think you just click and I'll see you there. Okay, great. And then we just went for it. And we just trusted that we would just do it and then afterward discuss it and then do another one and then afterward discuss it. So like we didn't stop and try to perfect the online listing appointment. We didn't, Kev said, pull stats and I'll, I'll lead the conversation. It was like, cool, great. See you in five minutes. And that was it. I mean, and then, and then now it's like so much easier because we just know how to do it and we're getting better and we're getting more articulate and we're figuring out ways to add value virtually and, and we're just way better but we did not try to get perfect before we just did it so your your approach was just hey we're going to be fluid on this yep. right yep. all right that, that's yeah, it's the same example of um god level when you know an agent spends two months putting their uh, their uh, postcard together right yeah nobody cares like right. like like great i'm glad you are way more tech savvy than 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 I am, but nobody cares, right? It's just it's the touch, it's the touch, it's touch, and yeah, add value when when you can, but it's you know you don't want to get caught up in the details and you do nothing. So that's kind of the point Emily's making. That's great. Um, um, how do you look at the condition? Nancy, Nancy Simonson's asking, how do you look at the condition of the place? Does your um, does your oh, you yeah. yeah, Nancy. Good. Hi, Nancy. Um, good question. So I I think ultimately you do need to go to the property at some point. 
-hmm. But the purpose of a listing appointment is not to, this is how I view it. It's not to talk staging and it's not to talk pricing. It's to establish whether or not you have a working relationship and whether or not you're going to list together. Mm -hmm. And so you can do that by having a, an effective communication over Zoom, whatever. And then eventually, yeah, you would set a time. So if, if they agree, yeah, yeah, we love you guys. We want to hire you. Cool. Then I'll be there, you know, next week at noon. Right. Great. Then you, then you have to do it. But you're not, your advice on staging and your advice on pricing has really nothing to do with them wanting to hire you. They will hire you first and then you can give your two cents on the rest of it. Really? That's, that's how we look at that. Hi, Nancy. Hi, so you do a two-prong approach. I mean, not if we don't have to. And if it's a past client, we've been, I mean, we're fortunate enough to have a lot of past client listing appointments, so we've been in their home. And I mean, they can also simply like turn their computer around and we can get a general sense of it. Um, and no, having a two-prong approach is not the most time effective, but in this market, I mean, it's just what we have to do. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just, I think a lot of people go into listing appointments and I used to do this too, thinking like, I have to have all the answers. I mean, Kevin and I almost never give a price in a listing appointment. We go in and we ask questions, we build a relationship, we get them to love us and agree to work with us. And then, <laughs> then we give them the bad news afterward <laughs> about the price. But, but we, don't, we don't need to be so prepared and so perfect the day of, we just need to establish the relationship the day of. So just a Sorry. quick follow-up. So if they ask you, well, what do you what do you think my place is worth? Do you say, well, I'll, we'll wait for that? I mean, what I would actually say is yes, and also this market is so fluid. I have no idea what's going to happen in the next month or two months. So I always advise that in this market, especially, but even previous, that we're going to decide your price probably the day of listing. So if we're listing on June 1st, we'll decide May 31st and then we'll rock and roll. Now we'll give them a range in advance so that if they can't afford to sell or they're, you know, on the fence about renting, we can give them a range, but like it's too far out. Usually we go, if we go on a listing appointment a month or two or three in advance, we're not giving them a specific price. We're getting them to. And yeah, that can change, right? Yeah, totally. And we don't want to put our foot in our mouth by saying like, oh yeah, it's 300. And then all of a sudden they there's two sales by the time we list that are yeah. at 275. And now we've got to backtrack. Yeah. So pretty we'll wide open on that. Have that tough conversation, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, Tab, what stats are you guys using, uh, sharing on the zoom calls? Is it like info sparks or what, 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 what tools are you using for that? Yeah. So Emily is very much kind of our, our stats guru on it, but it's, it's just, um, yeah, it's 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 very much just market trends, info yeah. info info sparks, all the um, all the leading indicators, right? And it's super easy now to to say, obviously, um, you know, supply is increasing now. Supply is acting a little bit weird right now because so many people have pulled their listing, but supply is increasing. Market, you know, market time is increasing. Median sales price is going down. That's pretty much across the board, right? So we need to price price ahead of that. Um, but to to Emily's earlier point, the other thing to kind of seal the deal with that is you can just say loaded things statements like well obviously you're too smart just to hire the agent that tells you what the highest price is right you're going to hire the agent that you believe in their systems their team um and then i'm up front right in general that where you say listen places sell for the price that they're supposed to sell for in general right it's my job to sell this as efficiently as possible and a little bit over market value and when i work with the buyer it's just the opposite right that makes sense and then they're like oh okay um, and by the way, we, as us as agents know that for a listing agreement to be valid, uh, you've got to have a, a price filler in there, a space filler. They don't know that, yep. you know, they can sign a blank listing agreement and you, you know, like doesn't mean you're submitting it. Um, they don't, they don't know that, right. It's just in their mind. It's kind of like a buyer's broker agreement, right? We know that anybody can dodge those when push comes to shove, but the, the relationships implied by signing it. Yeah, that's all, that's great strategy. So let's let's that's awesome that you guys pivoted to this well and and you know M you kind of had that vision prior to this pandemic hitting. Um, Jess has asked, and I I'd be curious too. Um, you guys as a partnership, do you go to um, the listing presentations yourself um, yourself or together? And then second part of that question is, are your systems so so accurate and the same that it that if you do do them separately, are they very similar? I'll, I'll, yeah. So um, question number one, sometimes question number two, absolutely. 
So our systems are across the board. We go to a listing appointment, we come back, we hand everything to Molly. She doesn't care who the client is. She doesn't care who the listing agent is. The system, once they are agreeing to work with us, is exactly the same, no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not we go on the listing appointments together is, it's kind of case by case. Like, you know, if it's a real challenge, then we feel safety in numbers and also two heads are better than one and all of that. If it's a past client no brainer, then we'll typically go alone. But there are certain situations. I mean, I think when things are hard to price, Kevin will bring me or I'll bring him just because, because why, I mean, why wouldn't we? And we feel like when we go together, we never fail. When we go separately, we have a higher chance of failure. Got it. Got it. Um, so as far as partnerships are concerned, like, you know, again, what advice, you know, would you give if somebody's on this Zoom call, which, you know, with the, the password stuff, we still topped out well, well over 50 people, guys. So great job. People wanted to hear you with the password guru or uh, hiatus. But um, what advice would you give somebody that said, hey, I'm thinking of getting a partner? Like, what are, what, what are the adversity that you guys have to deal with? And, you know, what's, um, what's some of the best advice that you can give somebody for that? Yeah, I mean, kind of circling back to how we started initially is, you know, make sure you're not just looking for a friend, right? Um, that's it's a bad idea to get married. And it's a bad idea to, you know, form a partnership, right? So like, make sure like, it's truly you're better together. Um, and then, um, I mean, one thing and, and no one really asked, but we're happy to share is your business, it doesn't need to be a 50-50 financial business. It doesn't need to be an even split. And uh, my brother had given me some original advice when we, we got started. And he said, you know, inevitably, in my, in his opinion, that a lot of partnerships fail because somebody either outproduces someone else or they have different interests and things getting in the way. And it's not about the person producing more or being mad that they're making less money or it's, it could be the other way around, right? That the other person that's not producing as much or wanted to travel Europe for the summer feels guilt. So we split our profits 50-50, our expenses are 50-50, but we kind of in general like believe in America and capitalism and things like that, that, you know, if Emily wants to put her nose down and not just set eight appointments a week, uh, a month, which is our goal for every team member, but set 25, she should be rewarded for that. And, yeah. and that just eliminates, you, you've just completely eliminated the financial side of things. It's hard enough to keep partnerships together to begin with, but we just did that. So the finances would never be an issue. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, and what about you? Like what, what, what advice? And by the way, your brother, you, you gave your brother a shout out, but he walked out of the room. Now he's back. Oh. <laughs> he's hey, Keith. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hey. Keith. You're being quoted. Um, yeah. You guys had him. What about you? Hey, everybody. I was muted. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so that's um, the myth right there, Keith. So, ma'am, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree. I mean, two things that marriages i don't i don't know this to be true but i would imagine people in marriages fight over our money and kids right so we that that's what we are very protective of is we had a super solid financial plan to make sure that we didn't have um jealousy animosity like any imbalance financially and then when it comes to all of our employees we had full like we together recruited and we together interviewed, we together train in different ways. Um, we together do quarterly reviews and one-on-one -on -one meetings and all of that. But like, it isn't like I handle all the people and Kevin handles all the money. It's like, we both handle both um, because we have to be on the same page with those two things. Mm -hmm. um, but my ultimate advice, <laughs> and I've said this before and I'll, I'll like go to my grave. If you're thinking about a partnership, I, I would not recommend it. Um, be, unless you're 100% sure. It is not easy. Um, we happen to have been aligned and continue to be aligned, and we feel pretty good about the future of alignment, but it's like, it's really, really hard, and I think we're lucky and we're smart, but I don't think it's the, like, the default is, is, is usually we see, like, unsuccessful partnerships, so you really have to be in it for the right reasons, and the right reason, I think, is not sharing expenses. It's not um, sharing workload. It's not somebody to cover your showings while you're on vacation. Like that's, those aren't the right reasons. Um, and that's what I see. So I, I mean, generally I say, don't do it unless you really thought about it. And like, you got to get in the other person's bank account. You got to get in the other person's like goals for their life in their family. Like you have got to go deep before you say yes. Right. That's a, yeah. You got to, you got to understand who they are. Right. And what you guys right. get the values. 
What's the, yeah. um, you guys have touched on this a little bit, but I want to, I want to dive deeper into it. What's the hardest part of your partnership? <laughs> I mean, the good news is that's a hard, hey, Keith, mute yeah. yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 That's class, right? So that's good. That's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. My brother clearly wasn't our tech okay. advisor. Although um, he was saying, hey, she wouldn't recommend it, which I can respect, right, Meg? AM. But like, she wouldn't recommend it. But then when you ask what's the hardest part of your, con you know, your partnership, some people on this Zoom call might be like, well, you guys are making it work, right? So what, what is the hardest part? Yeah, I mean, the reason why that's a tough answer is because it, it hasn't been very hard. It right. just, it really, it really has not been difficult. So, I mean, I think, it, just repeating what Emily says, right? Like, it would get hard if you're not on the same page, you haven't set your expectations ahead of time, you don't have similar, you know, core values and whatnot. If you do all the stuff ahead of time, then it then it shouldn't be that hard mm -hmm. um of course you're gonna have blips and things like that but uh, honestly it, it it's really not been that hard it's been kind of me being flexible and my natural tendencies and emily doing the same mm -hmm. but it just hasn't been hard hey maybe, uh, go ahead emily. in the first year kev if we like look back to what was hard like i think i'm trying to like I'm thinking back to like 2017 and early 2018, like probably what was the hardest and we've sort of figured it out now was each other's ability to let the other one, other person have like outside interests right. like that are, that are like sort of about our business, like, yeah. like different investment opportunities, different streams wow. of income, different coaching opportunities. Like we, we have things that are kind of related to PhD, but are actually not within PhD and letting each other have the space to do, to kind of run other activities right outside PhD. They're so closely related to what we do, but they're not actually part of our team. Right. Um, and so that was hard to like figure out. Do you agree, Kev? Like how to let each other do that successfully? Yeah, yeah. I, I you know, there's things that Emily's passionate about that I'm not, and and you know, whether it's business building or whatever, and just kind of respecting that and supporting yeah. that. Um, and then in general, like you can't have an ego and, and have a partnership because at times somebody's going to do something great and they, they're going to get the, you know, Emily's published and writes a lot of articles and things like that. Like if that were to bother me that, Hey, that my face isn't there or whatever, right. You, that, that stuff's trivial stuff that you just can't, you can't have. You gotta, yeah. have, you gotta have the ability to check your ego. Yeah. Yeah. So that's yeah. That's hard. I would say. All right. I'm going to end with one last question. I'm going to direct this question to Molly Mudd. So Molly, you're going to have to unmute yourself. Why does their partnership work uh, from your perspective? Hi guys. Um, I think Emily and Kevin's partnership works is because, I mean, they just care about their business like so much. Like everything that they do is at like the forefront of, is it going to make like us eight happy? And they're not like selfish in that. Emily and Kevin are always looking out for the best interest of the team and the team to be sustainable over time. Um, that's always, I feel like at the, at like the back of our minds, whenever we make any type of decision, it's not like what's going to make us happy today. What's going to make us happy a month from now? No, in five years when PhD is still here, you yeah. know, what did we do today that is going to continue to make it successful? That's all. Awesome. Thank you, Molly, for saying that. Yeah. There, you can tell that yeah, their, of their, course. their vision is real, right? You know, and uh, mm -hmm. they're both integrous people to make sure that that happens and they put you guys first and we know that about them. So for sure. Guys, that is a wrap for today, um, for the Lunch and Learn today. I appreciate you guys. First and foremost, I'm super proud of both of you guys. Uh, you know our history and stuff like that, and you guys are rock stars, and I appreciate it so much that you guys have you know, taken the bull by the horns and just gone with it and, and built an awesome uh, business up with great culture. So kudos to you guys. Um, guys, if you guys have questions for Emily and Kevin, I'm going to speak for them because I know them very well. And you can reach out to them, <laughs> right, guys? You yep. can reach out to them. So, um, Em, why don't you uh, tell them the best way to re reach you? And, Kev, you do the same? Yep. First name, last name at KW is the best place to find me. Cool. Me too. Okay, that'd be Kevin Hinton at KW. So, reach out to them if you guys are talking about a partnership or thinking about partnership, because I promise you they will be integrous and they will let you know. Tomorrow's Lunch and Learn, guys. Anyone got some questions about the stimulus package that's going on right now? Mm -hmm. We've got some questions. 
Yeah. All right. So um, Donald uh, Han Kiyabasa is going to join us tomorrow, and he is going to go over the stimulus package. He has a presentation for it. He's ready to go. I promise you guys I will put the password in there this time now that Zoom has changed the rules on us, um, so we won't have any issues jumping in. But appreciate you guys. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the sun. Much love. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Thanks Bye, everyone.